All right. So what I want to talk about is uh, um, what we have been covering so far. In fact, you've seen me write down this set of equations a little bit um, mid-semester as we were about to introduce Faraday's law. So let me write them down again as a reminder. I have this memorized as a physics major, but you guys might not have them memorized yet. Um, so let me write them down first, and then I'll write down their names. Um, the one regarding the electric field, E dot dA, is uh, you know, integrated over a closed surface. It's the amount of charge enclosed over epsilon naught. And we talked about an analogous version for magnetic field, that if you try to compute this quantity, except for magnetic field, that you get zero. So this is a magnetic flux integrated over a closed surface that it's always equal to zero. Does anyone remember why it was equal to zero? Well, it that doesn't, this doesn't, it, it's not expressing uh, any kind of change. It's expressing, uh, so the way to understand the flux is to look at how many field lines are going through a surface. So what this is saying is that, let's say I, um, I have some field lines in space. Imagine um, seeing this kind of, can you believe that these represent electric fields? Yes? What kind, what generates electric fields that look like this? Like if I had a positive charge here, right? And what Gauss's law is saying is that if we just imagine an imaginary closed surface, like a sphere that's enclosing this um, charge. I mean, it doesn't have to spear, it can be a, a cube or whatever, something that encloses this charge. And the conceptually, what the electric flux uh, amounts to is how many of these field lines are going through the surface. Anything that's going from inside to out, you count as positive. Anything that's going the other way, you would count as being negative. And what Gauss's law says is that you count all the field lines that are outgoing on net, and that's uh, equal to this quantity here, amount of charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. And you can see how that works. I mean, we kind of went through it, but you know, this is the kind of thing you would review for the final exam. <laughs> um, so you can kind of imagine a different surface, maybe a, a I don't know, is it this called a parallel pipette? Whatever, rectangular looking three dimensional shape. If you imagine um, flux that's going through this close to surface, then do you see that the net amount of uh, electric field lines going through it will be zero? Yeah, anything that's entering will also have to leave. Anything enters has to leave. So, so that's what this uh, is representing. Uh, so, in the context of magnetic field, intuitively, why would you say this makes a sense? That without, be, uh, without having to do any calculation, you can say, well, the net amount adds up to zero. Like what property of magnetic field? Not, so not about change, but what can you point to something about magnetic field that's a different from electric field that you can say, no matter how you set up the surface, it's always going to add up to zero. Kevin? So, right, that's what you see with the features. So, I let me. Yeah, so I want people to be able to explain that. So, that's something that you are used to seeing with the magnetic field. So, let me draw the common magnetic field lines that you might have seen, and you know, that's what you might be imagining. Um, like a field lines that go like this. That's the most common one that you would have seen with um, magnetic field. And um, 
So if you simply looked at it, you would say, oh, this is a magnetic field due to a, 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 due to a bar magnet with the north and south pole. And here, um, the feature you see is that when you now imagine a surface that's enclosing the magnet, for every field line that goes out, there's a field line that comes in. Why? I mean, so that is a feature you see. What a more fundamental thing could you point to and say, this explains the feature that you are seeing? Do you know? This is the one thing that magnetism is different from electricity. Uh, we could use that as a starting point. Tell me property of magnet. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So, I mean, it's a, on, another way to put it is this is a different ways of stating the same thing. And that's a way of, un, uh, that's a measure of how well you understand something. If you can state something in one way and one way alone, then you have memorized it, which is you know, better than not knowing anything, but you haven't really understood it. When you understood it, then you can express it in multiple different ways. So you might have just a, from, I guess, a matter of knowing basic science effect, you might know that, well, a magnet has north and south pole. Um, or oh, I just said that. Magnet always has the same number of field lines going in, going out as coming in. And a different way of stating the same thing is that the magnet always has north and south pole. That you never have north pole by itself and, or south pole by itself. If you split this in half, so trying to separate north and south pole, you would get just the north and south with the smaller magnets. So, so that's the basic um, feature of magnetism, that you never see a north pole. You never see, um, you never see a single pole by itself. So, um, so this is how I want you to think about um, every equation you see in physics and actually even engineering, every equation has a story to tell. If you are simply memorizing the mathematical expression, then once again, you are memorizing it without understanding it. It's, uh, there's, <laughs> once you are at high enough level, there's a lot of similarity between English and physics. Like you wouldn't, in English class, you wouldn't try to get by the class simply memorizing example sentences. You don't do, it's exactly the same in the way you shouldn't try to do that with the physics. If all you are doing is memorizing the form of the equation and stopping there, then the English equivalent would be you have memorized definitions of words, but you don't know its origin, you don't know how they are used in sentence, you don't know its synonyms. Like that, that would be the English equivalent. So each of these equations have a story that they are telling. Gauss's law for electric field says that this is a way of counting how many charges are enclosed within a surface, the way you saw with the electric field lines. And what this is saying, you could say that this is saying the same thing. The magnetic, this, this quantity, calculating this is a way of counting how many magnetic monopoles are enclosed within the surface. And with a uh, magnetic field, it just says, well, you can do that and you will get zero. Because so far, despite numerous search efforts, people have found no magnetic monopoles. So you could uh, go one step further and say that, that what this statement means is there are no magnetic monopoles. And I guess uh, with this statement, we kind of have to just stop here. Um, we don't really have an explanation of why are there no magnetic monopoles. 
In fact, in terms of theoretical physics, it would be nice if there were some magnetic monopoles, maybe just one. <laughs> and so people are looking for it, but the experimental fact is that no one has found it in a way that people could replicate it. There have been one or two cases where people thought they found it, but they tried to replicate the experiment in a larger scale, and they couldn't. But um, so until somebody finds a magnetic monopole, this is the version we'll go with. When somebody eventually finds it, we'll say, you know, it's uh, the magnetic charge and close the uh, times mu naught. Um, but until then, we'll just leave it in this form. Um, so these two you have seen so far. And we have been, so the subject of your exam three um, it was, um, what's what I'll write down now? Uh, Ampere's law and Faraday's law. So Ampere's law says that it deals with this magnetic field. It says that instead of calculating the flux, you calculate a line integral, um, B dot DL. And you are calculating this integral around the loop. Now, um, normally you wouldn't do this with the electric field. Because the type of electric field you have seen in static electricity, if you did this, you would get zero. So you wouldn't do that. But with the magnetic field, when you do it and do it around the closed loop, then you get, uh, then this is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. And we spent a um, fair amount of time talking about what it means for current to be enclosed. Do you remember? So let me draw this as an example. Suppose I have a current that's uh, going from left to right. Um, so you know it's just an infinite long line of current, I. Um, how would I choose a loop that loop that would be basis of this integral here? How would I choose a loop that somehow encloses this current? Circle around it. Okay, so. So you mean the Amperian uh, loop that you will pick would look something look like this, right? Um, so in what sense does this uh, loop enclose this uh, long line of current? So this is correct, but like, can you explain why? In what sense this encloses it? I mean, but it doesn't enclose in the traditional sense, right? Like if I talk about enclosing a charge, that's easy to imagine. You know, charge is a one-dimensional or it is actually a three-dimensional object. It occupies some volume. And I put that thing that occupies a volume within another volume. Then I say that's enclosed. And you can see that you know, without going through any of the surfaces here, it can get out. So we say that's uh, what it means to enclose a charge. So that's why we didn't bother you know, going through this detail with the Gauss's law. It's intuitively clear what it means for a charge to be enclosed. But with the current, we had to be more, more mathematical, more formal. Because here, I mean, <laughs> the current it comes in from very far away, very far away from this loop. And it also moves out to very far away from the loop. So we want to be uh, more precise about what it means for this current to be enclosed. It, it's not enclosed in the sense that it's confined within this uh, loop. So it's been a while since we talked about it, so you might have forgotten. Anybody remember? Um, how I try to make more precise what it means for current to be enclosed um, inside the loop. So going through a loop is a, it, 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 it's a step in the right direction. So you mean if I have a loop, we say if it's going through the loop, it's enclosed. If it's not going through the loop, then it's not enclosed, right? 
Uh, but what, it, what does it mean for, uh, I want to make it mathematically uh, clear. What does it mean for this current to go through a loop? Im imagine something like this. If I had a current that's going like this. If, so imagine this is a wire that my current is flowing in. If my current is going like this, is it going through the loop? So current comes in, bends around, and comes back out. Do you want to consider that as going through the loop? Not really, right? So however we define the current, we want to say, be able to say that something like this, it doesn't really go through the loop, but something like this, where it goes through and goes out to infinity, actually goes through the loop. What about something that's going around like this? Would you say this goes through the loop? Right? It goes through inside one way, and then the other time as it's coming around, it's actually not going through, so it doesn't cancel out this time. So we want to have a mathematically precise definition of what it means for this line to go through a loop so that we can actually count, we can actually calculate. Do people remember how we did that? It's a geometry question. So it's the sort of similar uh, conceptual exercise as what we did when we were defining right-hand rule. I mean, you know, I could have given that right-hand rule to you to simply memorize the by rote, but that's something you would forget right after this class. I, I didn't want to go that way. So I want to make sure we spend the right amount of time on this as well. I can just give you the rule, just something to memorize by road, and you'll forget it right after this class, and it won't do you any good. So the way we defined the right-hand rule was we are trying to come up with a quantity that, was, that had a direction that was associated with the two quantities that has direction. I mean, uh, when, when we are introducing right-hand rule, cross product, you already knew about that product. So you knew how to multiply two vectors in a way that they give you a scalar. But we are trying to define a quantity that has direction. So what we started out with was, well, if you have two vectors, what kind of geometric quantity does this can this define? And we said it can define a plane. Right? And then everything else starts from that. You try to associate a vector with a plane, and so that's a normal vector, and you try to come up with a sense of direction for that. That's where a right-hand rule actually comes in. So we do this, we can, uh, we can start a similar line of inquiry, as in I have a loop. So it's a question of what other associated geometrical object can a loop help me define? So a loop is a one-dimensional uh, linear object. Chris, you had an idea for what a loop can define? Uh, a plane also. Yeah, loop can define a, a surface, surface. I want to be more general than a plane, because a loop can be something crazy like this. Like something like this, this is a loop. It doesn't quite define a plane, but it can define a, what's called an open surface. It can define a surface that's bounded by this loop. So. This loop, for example, can define this, um, oh, let me not use red. This loop can define this circular um, open surface that has a bound, that, that has the loop as its boundary. Okay? And then what we can say is, well, what it means for the current to go through the loop is that it goes through this surface. So each time the line goes, pokes through the surface, we count it as being enclosed. So you see that that rules out this as uh, being enclosed in a net sense, because it pokes through once, and then it pokes back out the other way, so those two cancel out. Whereas this one, it pokes through one way, but the, as it comes around, it doesn't poke through again, so it counts only one way. So, and I think it, uh, the next level of discussion is which we kind of um, skipped the first time we saw it because, you know, we're going to come back to this. Um, 
so this is the question. Is this circular surface the only surface this loop can define? Or are there other surfaces that this same loop can also define? Where's my orange? Um, are there any other surfaces that this circular loop can also define that's not this circle? Right? Imagine this uh, circle is being made out of rubber, so you just start stretching it. And I, the example I did during lecture was with a balloon, right? This uh, uh, opening is the loop, and as I put more air in it, the surface stretches, but it's still bounded by the same opening. So here you could uh, imagine this uh, green area being bounded by the loop, or you could imagine something like this being bounded by the loop, some kind of cylindrical area that you know, first stretches out this way, and then has opening here, and then stretches out this way. Right? So there's an actually what seems to be an ambiguity. As in, um, as this current comes in, so we are trying to say, in trying to define precisely what it means for current to go through, we want to say, well, the moment it goes through the surface is when it's enclosed. But it seems like if we choose this blue loop instead of a blue surface area, instead of this green surface area, then the current actually pokes through here instead of not here. So, so everyone sees the ambiguity here, ambiguity in choosing different surface, um, sort of surface that's uh, defined by the loop, same loop. So the question here is then, does this ambiguity matter? As in, can you come up with a situation where using this, um, using this surface, you would say a current is enclosed, but using this surface, you would say current is not enclosed. So let's uh, think through a couple examples. So the example that's drawn on the board, it doesn't actually matter which surface you pick, right? The current still pokes through each of these ones. What about um, the, this example that I was looking at, where current comes in, turns around, then goes back up? Um, if you choose the, if you choose the circle as your surface, then is your net current zero? Still zero, right? Uh, what if uh, you pick something like so, and you know, if you pick the cylindrical surface with uh, this end being closed, it's still zero, right? Okay, let me try changing the circumstance a little bit. So if I pick this one where the current goes through and then loops around like this, then you have non-zero net current going through. All right, this gives me an idea. What if I do something like this? Like current depends like this. In this case, the net current going through this surface, that's zero, right? It never actually pokes through. What about the net current through this um, cylindrical area? Think through carefully. So there's a positive coming in through the surface, and then what happens? Yeah, it has to live through the side, right? So, so it turns out, so in this case, it's zero. And it turns out, what, um, no matter what kind of example you can think of, the current that comes in has to live somewhere so it's not as though current can simply disappear because charge is conserved. The, this ambiguity in picking your surface ends up not mattering for the application of Ampere's law. That's why you know, we didn't spend a lot of time on it because uh, this is a kind of a um, theoretical academic conundrum that turns out doesn't really matter. But we are actually going to come back to this in a little bit today because it's actually consideration of this that leads to one additional law of physics that you haven't, um, you didn't know yet. Um, so we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so, um, so let me pause a little bit here. So we had these three, uh, well, three equations or really two laws of physics. Um, we had, 
So we have Gauss's law. Both of these are called Gauss's laws. And we have, um, um, I need enough space here. We have Ampere's law. And I don't know if you guys remember the introduction to Faraday's law. Um, I told you guys that once you know this much of electricity and magnetism, it's like a puzzle piece that's uh, you know 80% complete. You can begin to see the pieces that you don't have. Not just the pieces that you have from experiment, but pieces that you think you should have, but it's uh, apparent from what you already have that it's missing. That you know, like, so when you're doing puzzle, it's uh, like there are pieces that you don't even know that you are missing, and there are pieces that you know are missing because you, know, you need those pieces to complete a particular area of the puzzle. So Ampere's law was introduced as one of those missing areas, and what I told you then was that there's another missing area here. So, and, what, as a reminder, what has helped us reveal these missing areas is looking for consistency with existing laws of nature. So, uh, as you know, once again, this is something that we have gone over before, but it's worth saying again. The way you can see that Ampere's, uh, sorry, Faraday's law is missing is that we have such a thing as a motional EMF or motion induced the voltage. So that's the thing that comes from the Lorentz force law. The electromagnetic force is charge times V, oops, uh, let me write this in a proper way. Charge times electric field plus V cross B. Right, this is the Lorentz force or the force on an electric charge due to electric and magnetic field. And the specific example that we looked at was the example of a solenoid that's moving in the field of, in the, in the magnetic field. So if I have, I mean, if I have this magnetic field and you know, in the demo that you saw, you saw that when this, um, when this solenoid moves, then there's a voltage induced in it. And we can explain that using this uh, electromagnetic force. But what we could not quite explain then without introducing additional law of physics is what happens if it's the magnet that's instead of moving. Right? And experimentally, you see the same voltage induced. And just from theoretical consideration, it should make sense to you that it doesn't make, it should not make a difference whether it's the loop that's moving or if it's the magnet that's moving because of what's called the principle of relativity. You, laws of physics are the same in any reference, any inertial reference frame you are in. So whether you are in a reference frame where the magnet moves or you are in the reference frame of the magnet and it's the loop that's moving, the end result, the charge is moving, should be the same. And if it is a loop moving, then you are fine. This gives you the, the induced electric field or what looks like a kind of analogous to electric field and you can explain movement of charges based on that. But what you could not explain was when magnet moves, then the only thing happening is that magnetic field is changing, but there's nothing that has the velocity in the, in the solenoid here. So you need, this is the place where you have an internal contradiction. Your theory is incomplete. Two things that should result in the same picture do not say that they result in the same picture. So this is where you have to begin to introduce new laws of physics so that those two pictures agree. And Faraday's law is really the first of these laws that are introduced to enforce the consistency within uh, laws of electricity and magnetism. So let me do it in different colors. So this was Faraday's law as we introduced. So um, you have some quantity that's analogous to voltage, induced electric field times the 
so the line integral of electric field around the closed loop. And this is actually a new kind of quantity because until so far, as I was uh, writing this down, I said if you did this, you would get zero because you know electric field it's a conservative force, so it's path independent. When you go around in a loop, when you do this, you get zero. But what we are now saying is that well, it's not always zero. You can come up with the situations where it's not zero, and that exact situation is where the magnetic field is changing, in the situation where the magnet is moving. So in that case, you would get this. This is equal to minus, this is the minus sign that we, uh, we introduce an entire law to explain this minus sign, Lenz's law, <laughs> times the rate of change of magnetic flux. So that, that's why sometimes I say electrostatics and magnetostatics. So because we are limiting ourselves to where the charges were not function of time, charges weren't moving around, and then later we are limiting us to where the currents are not a function of time. So now, to, in this situation, we are removing all those restrictions. We are saying the charge might be a function of time, current might be a function of time, magnetic field might be a function of time that opens up the possibility that, that magnetic flux is a function of time, so this derivative may not be zero, then you get this. And this is Faraday's law, and um, this was the subject of your exam three, and in case, you know, it's been a while, so you might have forgotten how it was introduced, but the way I, I like to introduce, I don't know if your text, I don't think your textbook does it that way, because, you know, frankly, this is an experimental law. I'm pretty sure that's how far they or originally just um, discovered it. But um, I'm saying if you are more theoretically inclined, you could have actually guessed at it by enforcing a type of consistency with motion-induced voltage that you, you, can, you have seen and you can guess theoretically. So this is the first of the two missing pieces that you can get based on the laws of electro electromagnetism that you already know. And what we are going to spend the rest of today talking about is this last piece. So this is, a, um, so it turns out the Ampere's law as you know it is incomplete. It's a half of Ampere's law. There's one more term there that no one noticed it until a guy named uh, James Clark Mark Maxwell um, thought that that should be there. That's why we call this entire set of equations, what color should I use? Um, that's why we call this entire set of equations, we call this Maxwell's equations. And it's because, it's not because Maxwell came up with all of them, he didn't. He didn't come up with any single one of these equations, but he was the guy who came up with what's called Maxwell term. It's the very last term to be discovered, to be reasoned through in electricity and magnetism. And since this is the piece that completes electricity and magnetism, he gets to put his stamp on it. Sort of, you know. Doesn't matter <laughs> if you're the first to discover. It matters if you know you are the, I guess, first to discover of the last correct form. <laughs> so you know we call this a set of four equations, the Maxwell's equations, and this is the Maxwell term, and that will be the important term for what we are going to talk about today. Really, um, electromagnetic waves. So we'll, uh, if I'm on time, I'll be able to introduce it right towards the end of today's lecture, and. Um, during the lab section, we'll go over these properties of electromagnetic waves and a bunch more stuff. So, so we need a particular physical situation to consider. Um, that's similar to this physical situation that we are considering. Because you know, when you are looking for these missing pieces of laws of nature, it, they are not evident in every single situation. Like this Faraday's law, you could have done a bunch of 
electrostatic and magnetostatic questions and never come across Faraday's law situation. It's only when you consider this particular setup of is the coil moving or is the magnet moving that you start thinking about, oh, I have a law of, law of nature that's missing. So with the Maxwell term, this is the physical situation that, um, that Maxwell considered that allowed people to, or allowed Maxwell, to realize that there is a missing term in our laws of nature. So you have a current flowing. And this ambiguity in the surface that you can define, that's actually important. Now let me make a small, but you know, before we said this ambiguity doesn't matter because the current enclosed, enclosed is the same either way, right? Now let me make one tiny modification that will um, make that ambiguity important again. So what I'm going to do is I have a long wire that's going through like this. And I see that to introduce a contradiction, introduce some kind of self inconsistency, what I need to do is I need to make the uh, current through this surface different from current through this surface, right? I need to have some current coming in and not leaving through this surface here. And I cannot really have current leaving through any of the side surfaces either. Because if I did that, then they would have net zero current. All right, so using what you know about uh, circuits, this is now something you can do. You can imagine this current being kind of a stopped by a capacitor. So instead of a wire connecting through, if you imagine a capacitor being introduced here, so this is kind of a large gap capacitor, but imagine it's a capacitor. Then now you see that this current that's coming in, it's not jumping across the capacitor gap. It's getting stored here as positive charge, right? As that happens, now, you know, if you are looking at it on this other side, then there is actually current flowing here, right? The capacitor doesn't actually stop the current, um, but the way the current that flows out here happens is you have an accumulation of negative charge on this plate. But this is something you can say. When you are looking at in the, when you are looking at in the in-between region, I guess purple is the only color. When you are looking in the in-between region, there is no current here. No charge ever jumps across the gap. You have positive charge that comes in here, which attracts a negative charge. So that means negative charges are flowing this way. That looks like a positive charge, a positive current flowing the other way. But you, this is something we can say. There is no current that's actually jumping across this gap. So now we have introduced the uh, internal contradiction because when you look at current and close to through the blue surface, then so current and close to through blue surface is the current that was coming in. Let me call that I naught. Um, that's uh, I naught because you know it pokes through and it never leaves through any of the side surfaces. So that is my current enclosed. But when you look at the current enclosed through the green surface, then, well, no charge ever crossed this surface. So this is now zero. Yeah. So, so this is an ambiguity that now matters. So you are trying to calculate magnetic field at this point, for example. And if you pick to your, so, and you know, this is the Amperian loop that you picked. And if you had a, for whatever reason, if you picked a blue surface as the surface that's being enclosed by your Amperian loop, then you would have gotten this sensor as your enclosed current. On the other hand, if you went in with a simple surface of the circular surface, then you would have gotten, my enclosed current is zero. Now you have two different answers. 
I guess they can both be wrong, but at least one of them must be wrong. So, you know, at this point, at this point in space, you are going to have some kind of magnetic field. So at this point in space, you will have some kind of magnetic field as a function of position at that point in space. Will this magnetic field be consistent with calculation given through this number or calculation given through this number? Or which one, which one of the two do you think is more likely to be wrong? Like this seems wrong, right? It seems to suggest that there's an abrupt change introduced by just this capacitor being there. But hopefully, intuitively, you think, you know, if I have a current of wire, and if I suddenly replace some part of it with the capacitor, that actually doesn't change anything other than what's going on with the capacitor. So yeah, so we start out with that intuition that somehow, even though it's not supported by current Ampere's law, that the result that's going to be obtained with this is still the correct result. So now what we do is, we, by saying that this is the correct result, we are saying that uh, somehow this form of Ampere's law is lacking. It's missing a term. And now we are going to try to guess at what this term must be so that, um, the, so that you know, if we calculate the magnetic field using this, uh, we would get the same answer. But now this is the challenge. Uh, we want to think locally. We want to think, what can I calculate using only the quantities that are available along in this circular area? So you know, this blue area, that's kind of remote. It's more global. I need to reach out to some space that I may not have access to. Um, but so now what I want to do is I want to come up with a set of terms so that I can use only the information that's in this uh, surface and still come up with the same result. So my current enclosed will still be 0. But what I need to do is I need to come up with some other quantity that I can say is um, analogous to the current. Sort of like how the magnetic field can produce a quantity that's analogous to electric field, the induced electric field. So, so the quantity that we are going to come up with here, that's the quantity that is called displacement current. And I'll just have to tell you that it's an old fashioned term. So the only sense in which this is, this is like a current is that this is the quantity that's going to be replacing the I N closed. But let me actually write it down. You will see that in it, um, it has nothing to do with the charges moving, at least not literally through. Um, so, but it's going to be some quantity that will still be associated with this current flowing in. So I guess what I want you to consider is what kind of effect does this current have that you can measure with only the sensors that are placed in this, along this surface? Like imagine that you, know, you have access to nothing else. You, you simply know um, two things. You know that there's current coming in here. And you know there's something you can measure here that will let you figure out what this current is. What kind of things can you measure here? Other than magnetic field, since that's kind of circular reasoning. <laughs> We're trying to, get, trying to get at an expression for magnetic field. So what can you measure here that tells you that there's a something going on with the capacitor? Chris? Yeah, there's going to be electric field. So when this capacitor wasn't charged up at all, with no charge on it, uh, if you measure the electric field in between the capacitor, you would have gotten zero charge. Right? As the current comes in, you would have charges accumulating on the capacitor, ne positive and negative. And you still don't, from here, you don't actually have access to the charges. 
but what you do have access to is the electric field that those charges are going to be generating. So uh, let me draw write down E to make sure it's electric field, it's not current. So as more current comes in, there'll be more charges accumulating and there will be electric field, more electric field generated. So Chris, help us clarify this. Um, is it the electric field itself that tells you that there's current or something else that's associated with the electric field? Like if you, if you are sitting between the capacitors and you measure the electric field, would you based on that alone say there's current coming in or would you need to see something else? Yeah, so if you had the charges accumulated on the capacitor, then you would already accumulate it. Then with no current coming in, you would have electric field, right? So what, what do you need to be able to say about the electric field to say that there's current coming in? Oh, yeah, that it's changing. That in this case, the electric field is increasing. But what's going to be important to hear is, um, so, so, okay, it'll be no current, but there, as the current flows in, there will be a change of electric field. And this is going to be the basis of what we call displacement current. We have to assemble the quantities in a way so that it has correct units and everything. Um, but so let's take the break now. And when we come back from break, we will um, guess this Maxwell term based on these simple two facts that, or simple two assumptions that um, both of these situations should lead to the same answer for Ampere's law. So, uh, for, yeah, for Ampere's law. So, um, if we pick the blue surface, we already got an answer. And we are trying to use this quantity for this green surface in a way that it, we are going to get the same answer. Um, so, uh, I guess that is both of the facts. One is that the laws of nature are actually consistent. It's internally consistent. It doesn't somehow change depending on these arbitrary surfaces you pick. And the second thing is, okay, uh, given that they look different, the new term we are going to introduce, it's going to make this arbitrary surface difference no longer matter anymore again. So that whichever surface you pick, you'll still get the same answer again. Okay, okay so uh, when we come back from break at Two, oh, I spoke too long. Uh, 202, then uh, we will go through just the considerations to figure out what this displacement current should be so that this um, particular problem is resolved. So let's wrap up this discussion of displacement current. So I guess uh, I'm going to describe what I'll do as a brainstorm or stream of consciousness because this is what I have so far. I know where I want to get to. I want to have some quantity that'll lead me to say this IN close to being zero doesn't matter. It's as if it's the same current that's coming in. And I know this current is related to this uh, change of electric field. But I have no formula that's giving me that direct connection. So um, I don't know if you guys have done any stream of consciousness writing. I'm just gonna start from one point. And I'm just going to write down all the relationships I know, hoping that uh, from this starting point, uh, I will somehow be able to get to this end point that contains a term with this and all the other coefficients that I need with it. So let me just <laughs> um, start that as some kind of stream of consciousness or brainstorm. I don't know what the correct term would be. So, you know, ideally, this is something that you could do with a lot more time in group setting, but I don't really have that time. So let me just uh, uh, speed through it. So I'm just gonna start out with a current. Current is something that I know, that's the place I would start from. So when you do something like this, sometimes uh, um, you might want to go backwards, like start from the end point and go the other way. But um, my preference almost always to go in the forward direction. 
it's only when you get stuck that you at least consider backward direction. This is, by the way, the same with any kind of mathematical proofs you might do. Um, so I start out with the current. So I have current I naught coming in. Uh, what is this current, what else is this current related to that I can write down some equations for? Chris? Okay, current is related to uh, V over R. Now in this setup, is there any register anywhere? So yeah, there's no register, so this relationship is there. I might write it down as I'm brainstorming, but it probably won't get me to where I want. But you know, you can write it down and it's the whole idea of brainstorm. You don't, not everything you write down has to be correct, but hopefully, so as you're doing this, you have to critically think for yourself. You know, does this relate to my end goal? And when you recognize it doesn't, label it as dead end and um, try something else. Uh, uh, anything else? It's also the rate of change of charge over time. Yeah, so this is, that's the other relationship, right? When you have capacitor, the amount of current coming in is related to rate of change of the charge on the capacitor that you had to, with when you are dealing with the circuit. So this current is the rate of change of the amount of charge on the capacitor. All right, so I can go from current to charge on the capacitor. Now I guess what I want to express, so I see that this is going somewhere because it's a having to do the capacitor. Now, um, hmm, does, is there a way this directly relates to electric field? Charge on capacitor with the electric field. Does anyone remember the formulas? This is where a good knowledge of, um, this is where why I keep telling you to memorize <laughs> formulas. When you're doing brainstorm like this, um, it's a lot easier if you don't also have to look through your formula sheet. If you can just uh, scroll through what's already in your head. So let me, you know, speed through this portion. I'll just write down the formulas that I do have memorized. This, these are the set of formulas that were useful for dealing with a capacitor. If I have parallel play capacitor setup, or more precisely, it's a parallel infinite plane of charged particles. I have uh, uh, charge density of plus a sigma on one, minus a sigma on the other, then the with this setup, do people remember what the electric field between those two were? Yes, no? Is it sigma over permittivity of space? Permittivity of, yeah, sigma over epsilon naught. Sigma over, I prefer to call it electric constant because permittivity, permeability, who knows what they mean. <laughs> but you do know that epsilon naught has to do with electricity. So this is the formula that hopefully you have memorized. This is the electric field in between parallel play capacitor. Yeah. Once you remember this much, then now you recognize that the sigma has something to do with the charge. That's the charge density, Q over A. So you know we started out by saying it's an infinite play capacitor, but in a real capacitor, it's going to have some finite area A. So let's, uh, let me rewrite, down, rewrite this electric field as Q over A over epsilon naught. All right, it seems like I can actually rewrite this. So um, let me rewrite it this way. So I'm going to take this expression, electric field magnitude is equal to this right hand side and solve this for Q. I can say, Q is equal to um, area times E, or area times epsilon naught times E. All right, so <laughs> epsilon naught times area times E. Um, all right, so um, continuing with this uh, line of thought, I can take this, plug it in here, and see what happens. When I take this and plug it in here, I get rate of change of time, I mean rate of change with respect to time uh, of epsilon naught A electric field magnitude. Um, 
epsilon naught is a constant, right? That's a electric constant. Um, area, it's a constant, right? Now, what is it area of? Because this is a common situation that people get into where you have more than one um, variable representing a type of quantity and you get them mixed up. People do that every single time with the, the, the E over M experiment that a lot of you did. You have more than one circle, so you get radius for one circle mixed up with the radius for other circle. So here, I want to be careful. Which area are we talking about? Are we talking about these areas that are being defined by Amperian loop? Or is it some other area? I see that I have drawn it confusingly. Let me draw my capacitor a little bit smaller so that you can see the cross-sectional area of a capacitor, which might be represented by this, is significantly smaller than the Amperian loop um, area. Which area are we talking about? Yeah, this area, cross-sectional area of the capacitor, right? because that was the sense in which we are using A every single time. It's a charge on capacitor over area of the capacitor. So here, this is still area of the capacitor. So, um, yeah. So, um, I guess nothing actually stops us from writing it down this way. We could write it down this way, epsilon naught A times D dt. Epsilon naught A times D dt. But I'm kind of looking forward or backward to how this expression is written. And when I write this down, I want it to have some kind of similarity to some stuff I already have. So this, um, remember the definition of magnetic flux. Magnetic flux was magnetic field times the area. I mean, you know, if you are being picky about it, this is actually the dot product between the two vector quantities. And if you are being really picky about it, then, you know, it's actually, if magnetic field is not uniform, then you have to imagine integrating it. So, you know, there are all those uh, refinements that you might want to worry about, depending on the problem. But at the very basic level, magnetic flux is magnetic field times area. So we want to do the same thing here and express area times electric field as the electric flux. So say that this is the quantity that we are going to define as the electric flux. It's not like this is the first time you are seeing electric flux. This is also electric flux. Except every time this came up, I kept saying, I don't care about electric flux. <laughs> Apparently you do, um, depending on the situation. So we do that symbol. This is how we would write down the final version of this uh, line of expressions. Starting from this I naught, we would say, well, this relates to the charge on the capacitor, which relates to the electric field. Uh, which leads to this final relationship. So epsilon naught is still constant. Let me pull it out. Epsilon naught times rate of change of the electric flux. So this is where you end up. That if you have certain amount of current coming into the capacitor, you can say that that is going to be related to how much the electric flux through this area is changing. And actually, I say electric flux through this area, but it's electric flux through this entire area since outside of this um, electric field is zero. So when you imagine doing that whole area integral, that reduces down to E times this area in the end anyway, when you do it properly. And so, so this is what we are going to call displacement current. This is the quantity. So this is the quantity that we are going to end up calling displacement current. This is displacement current. And this is probably a good place to ask this question. Um, 
In what sense is that like a current? In what sense is the rate of change of electric flux like a current? Is there a movement of charge involved through this surface? Through this surface? No, I mean, there has to be movement of some charge elsewhere for the electric field to be changing, right? But when you are looking locally, locally here, there's no charge that's moving across here. So in what sense is this quantity, which is, you know, the name for this quantity is displacement current. So it must have something to do with, um, well, I guess the, these words must mean something. The word current must mean something. The word displacement, um, that's actually a harder one to explain. It's an old-fashioned term. Yes? Because it, it modifies the current side of the flux? That's really the biggest reason. It, uh, um, this is the quantity that we are going to pretend is something that acts like a current here. It's going to enter into here. So the modified version of Ampere's law will look like this. If this additional term, it will have this coefficient of mu naught, just like the other term. It will be mu naught times displacement to current. So the sense in which this is like a current is sort of similar sense in which if V cross B was like an electric field. You see that here they are being added together. And I would not add them together unless they are like each other in some sense. And here, I guess, if, uh, you, if you had to go one step further, you could say this is like a current in the same sense that current can generate magnetic field. And this also generates magnetic field, the same way current does. But um, in, uh, beyond that, what this quantity is? Well, it's a rate of change of electric field. And um, I think the phrase displacement is a little bit, um, you know, I don't actually know the history of the term. What I do know from upper division electrodynamics is that there's a quantity called the displacement field. The displacement field was defined as epsilon naught times E. If it's in vacuum, this would be epsilon naught. If it's in matter, then this would be the permittivity of the material. So this is the quantity called the displacement field in upper division electrodynamics. And I'm pretty sure that term displacement comes from this term displacement. And if I had to stretch and guess why is this called the displacement, I would guess that has something to do with the separation of charge. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but really what I want you to take away is that this acts like a current in the sense that it generates magnetic field. Exactly the same way current does. And we express that here with the modification of Ampere's law. We have this one additional term to Ampere's law now. Uh, instead of simply saying uh, magnetic field is, this line integral of magnetic field is mu naught i enclosed, we say it's, well, that plus mu naught times that epsilon naught, the electric flux or rate of change of electric flux. This is the term we call Maxwell term. And this is the uh, last term of Maxwell's equations. With this, these four equations are combined are called the Maxwell's equation. And this is the, it's a representation, statement of our complete understanding of uh, um, electromagnetism. And, um, when you pause a little bit and look at it, you can see how much story this is telling. It, um, I don't know, if, have I said in this class that the theory of uh, electricity and magnetism is the first complete law of nature, complete theory of nature that we have? Uh, well, it is. <laughs> so, you know, everything else that you have learned so far before electricity and magnetism, it's all bits and pieces. So you had a Newton's law of motion, but it, simply relates force to acceleration. It doesn't say anything other than that. It doesn't tell you where the force is coming from. It doesn't like, so force can be spring force, it can be gravity, it can be electric force. So Newton's law of motion is not complete theory of physics. It's a tool to be used in analyzing other uh, theories of physics. 
there's a Newton's law of universal gravitation. And I guess in some sense, you could say that is a complete theory of physics in the sense that up until early 20th century, we didn't know what else they connected to. But theory of gravity is kind of, it's a boring theory. It doesn't really say other than, it doesn't say anything other than inverse square law. You kind of stop there. There's nothing more interesting to say about gravity after that. The thing about gravitational wave that you might have heard about that was, you know, top, well, actually it's a Nobel Prize this year, right? <laughs> so, or was it last year? But, um, but that actually comes out of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So that comes actually after this. So this is the first uh, interesting set of a uh, theory of uh, physics that says everything there is to say about a particular aspect of nature. So here, we are limiting ourselves to things that have something to do with electricity or magnetism. If it has nothing to do with electricity and magnetism, then this doesn't really tell us anything. The nuclear forces, this doesn't say anything. But surprising number of things are about electricity and magnetism. All the intermolecular forces, that explains why my hand doesn't go through the other hand. Uh, that's actually electric force at its very basic nature. Um, all the things that are binding molecules together, it's electric in its very basic nature. So electricity and magnetism, um, it includes a lot. And this theory tells you everything there is to know. You might say the rest is filling the details. And as you'll learn in physics 4C, those details actually can get complicated. But um, this is still correct as far as we know. Uh, even, uh, even when you include quantum mechanics, even when you include the special relativity, nothing that I wrote down here needs to change. This, uh, if you are doing graduate physics, you know, graduate school physics, this is still the place you would start from. Oh, except you would use the differential form that I'm gonna write down shortly. Um, so so this, that's the sense, of, I, I mean, this is the first complete theory of physics. And this is really the story I want you to spend a, uh, Take a little breather and notice what it's saying. So let's just go back through history quickly. We started out by saying that electric field is generated by charges. Not that new. I mean, it's uh, starting to get a little bit abstract, talking about fields and whatnot. But all right, that seems reasonable. And you know, when the same time we introduced the idea of field, we connect the field to force this way, right? So electricity, simple, um, whatever. And then we start talking about magnetic field. And you know, magnetism, we, I mean, we did talk about it, but uh, your intuition about magnetism has more to do with magnetic interaction between a permanent magnet and a ferromagnetic object, or between two permanent magnets. And when you look at magnetism that way, it's completely disconnected from electricity. There's nothing that looks electric here, right? And um, you might look at something like this demo that you saw a while ago, you know, this demo of a, a magnet falling through a conducting material somehow a lot slow, more slowly than otherwise. And that looks weird, but um, I guess this is not completely magnetic. But just looking at it, um, you wouldn't guess the immediate connection to the electricity. So really the modern electromagnetism, it starts out by highlighting the connection between magnetism and electricity. So here, Ampere's law actually starts um, off with that. It says that the magnetic field is generated by current or charges moving. And along the, about the same time we were introducing this, we introduced this because of apparent lack of magnetic monopole we have to say any kind of force due to magnetic field is actually force on a moving charge. So you need to have electric charge and you need to have velocity. So starting with Ampere's law, you are starting to build a connection between electricity and magnetism by saying a moving charge can produce magnetic field. Yeah. And I guess uh, you, um, this is the place where you might begin to wonder if the relationship, relationship is reciprocal, as in if a moving charge could produce magnetic field, 
then could a moving magnetic charge produce electric field? Well, there's no such a thing as a magnetic charge, but there are permanent magnets that do generate magnetic field. And when these permanent magnets move, they do generate electric field. And that's what you are seeing here. But because of a lack of magnetic charge, this has to be stated in a bit of a roundabout way. Instead of saying that magnetic current is generating electric field, we are saying, well, not magnetic current, because that doesn't exist, but the change of magnetic flux or change of magnetic field is what is generating electric field. And when you say it that way, you might, this is one more question that someone who has too much or just the right amount of time to think about this might ask. If a changing magnetic field can generate electric field, can the reverse happen? Can a changing electric field generate magnetic field? And up until this point, your answer was no. Your electric field could be changing. Now, if you mean by changing electric field, you mean current, then sure, <laughs> there it is. But this is what's saying, yes, changing current, uh, sorry, changing electric field will generate magnetic field. So, um, so the entirety of Maxwell's equation relationship is uh, this back and forth. What is the connection between the electricity and magnetism? And this is the one that closes the loop. This is the last set of relationships that says um, that what happens between, from magnetism to electricity also happens in reverse. It happens from electric field to magnetic field. And any sort of lack of symmetry between these two, it really comes down to the fact that there is no magnetic monopole. If there had been magnetic charge, then this would look something like this. Like this would be something like a mu naught times magnetic charge enclosed, right? And here it would look something like, oh, I have to get the units right. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I don't think I got this unit right either. Okay, let me stop here. I try this every semester and I haven't worked out the units ahead of time. So, um, but you know, you would introduce terms that depend on that missing magnetic charge. There will be one depending on magnetic charge here and there will be one depending on magnetic current here. So, you know, any asymmetry you see here now is from that asymmetry that uh, magnetic charges for whatever reason just doesn't exist. And that's why there are people still looking for magnetic monopoles. Uh, if somebody ever finds it, they'll win Nobel Prize probably based on that. Because <laughs> people have been looking for it for a long time. There are theories that says uh, why it might not exist or why might they be really rare, like one in an entire galaxy. And, um, but there are ready-made, uh, um, so uh, one of the questions in modern physics is uh, something called the quantization of charge. Why is electric charge, uh, why does it come in that unit that we see, charge of electron? And you can actually explain that once you suppose that there's at least one magnetic monopole. Then there's some quantum mechanical feature that you have to uh, make consistent and that'll explain it. But for the purpose of this class, we'll just uh, end here that there are no magnetic monopoles, but there's no good reason that they shouldn't exist. So, this is Maxwell's equations. It's the complete statement of electricity and magnetism. And um, now having spent all this time, we won't really do much with it. Uh, we will do exactly one thing with it. And this is the one thing that we needed this Maxwell term to do. It's to describe something called electromagnetic wave. 